Welcome to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games. I'm here with my great friend, Mark. How are you today, Mark? I'm very well, Walker. Thanks. How are you? I'm good. I'm excited. We have stuff happening in the background. We have some video editing being done. We have plans being made. This is all very exciting things. I'm excited. I'm excited. So stay tuned. Check your local listings for upcoming videos. I hope everyone's excited. Come to the guild. See what's happening. Well, what's happening on the guild is mostly people ragging on us. <laughs> I know. I love it. That's what's so good. There's like a, there's a thread that says, good stuff we said, and a thread named bad stuff we said. And that's four pages long. And the good stuff we, <laughs> the good stuff we said okay, well, is, while, is but a paragraph. While I I'm airing it. grievances, the thread that was <laughs> ostensibly about, well, enough, there, there's enough bad stuff being said elsewhere. What are some of the good stuff they said? I couldn't help but notice that the first reply, I don't even know who this is. If 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 they're a loyal listener, I'm sorry. But their first response, the what have they done well, was, well, the name of their podcast is accurate. <laughs> it's like, first of all, that's a joke we made three years ago when we started this. And every time someone repeats it, they think they've reinvented the wheel. And secondly, they had to just show up in the, why don't we try to say some nice things about them? No, no, no. Dunk on us it's again. Okay. It's okay, Mark. It's okay. I don't know that it is, Walker. This is a great podcast about board games, <laughs> things we love. We're going to talk about games we played this week, and then we're going to talk about news and why it doesn't matter, and then we're going to talk about our feature game this week, which is Eclipse, and probably more featured is Eclipse Second Edition. Mark, what did you play this week? I finally got to try some of the new Too Many Bones content. The expansions after Undertow had a number of characters, and one of them was Dart. Another one is the Lab Rats, which is a weird sort of multi-week character cycling in and out of the battle. I haven't tried those yet, and I haven't tried any of the, uh, the the Splice and Dice expansion where you make your own boss. I'm looking forward to trying those, but I just really wanted to try Dart, who seemed like an interesting character. She's got a cybernetic boar, whose name is Bored. I don't. So I. Yeah, I, I think that's appropriate. And I'd say I was very disappointed. I have to. This is the the first character in the very large roster of Too Many Bones where I just didn't get her at all. I think part of it is a character mismatch on my part. I've commented before that I'm a very conservative person, and I don't like having to marshal one shots. Generally speaking, I, I would rather deal with things like cooldowns or cycling or things like that. And the way Dart works as a character. All her attack dice exhaust, which is not something that is true of any other character. Attack dice you can reuse every round so long as you meet other throughputs. But for her, all her attack dice exhaust. And secondly, she can't roll more than one attack die per round against a single target. So you have to be very careful about marshalling your effects. She also has the effect of being able to boost her allies by throwing darts at them. So the, the theory, thematically, and it makes perfect sense, is she has some kind of performance-enhancing supplement, shall we say. Adrenaline, maybe? Yeah, not really. But she coats it on a dart, and then she throws it at the face of one of her friends. And as a result, you have to roll attack dice against your allies in order to deploy these buffs. Which, again, as a conservative player, is not something I'm inclined to do. So I found a lot of her powers to be very, very tricky and to run counter to my preferences. And as a result, I was just not able to make her work at all. This was a crippling series of humiliating failures. Uh, I played with her and with Gasket, with whom I had more success. Gasket, I know how to play. Uh, you know, that character makes more sense to me. And so I'm not, I'm really not in a position to comment whether I think that this was a series of design failures or whether it's just a, an utter mismatch with my style of play. Uh, the person with whom I was playing also agreed that Dart didn't really seem to make a whole lot of sense. But again, I was the one sitting there with Dart's reference sheets and I was the one who had internalized her, her rules. So I don't know how much of a, of, of a judgment that is. I will also say that I'm eagerly awaiting the Too Many Bones big box. I love big boxes when they're done well. I've seen so many videos about this stupid box because it's so compelling how they've engineered it all and all the, de the decisions they've made and all the money they've thrown at this project. And once again, this is one of those instances where I gave them a small amount of money with the expectation that I was going to wait a very long period of time to get this thing. And sure enough, it is now going to retail for well over double what I paid for it because it's a huge thing made out of MDF and magnets and new trays and new stickers and everything. Anyhow. Holy Goodness. My understanding is that it is slightly more proximate than it was before, so who knows what it'll get. But I can't wait because one of the biggest obstacles to playing Too Many Bones now 
is just the management of dealing with all this stuff. There are now so many characters, and each character has their own neoprene mat and their own set of chips and their own set of dice. And just managing all this, I've spent a fair amount of time organizing my Too Many Bones collection because, just to reiterate, I really love the game. It's one of my favorite adventure games. That and Assault on Doomrock, I think, might be the only adventure games I'm ever going to need. And I, despite that, it's still just a, a bit of a bear to, no pun intended, to get it to the table simply by, by managing it all. And my experience with both the Street Masters big box and the Sentinels big box has taught me that having one huge box, even though it might give you a hernia, does make it easier to get to the table and even to transport because nothing slides around. It's like, this is the box. This is what I am carrying. There we go. To have it all in one place is going to be great. I can't wait for that. I still love Too Many Bones. I'm not going to rush back to try and dart. I would probably want to give it to somebody else and see what they do with her and see if they're able to make her work in, in a successful way. And now I'm a little dubious about the lab rats as well for probably no good reason. But I think that the new content for Too Many Bones is best experienced a chunk at a time. And so that's what I've been doing. And I will probably be able to report back later with some of the other new stuff. And so that was Too Many Bones, specifically the dart character. I also went back to play an older game, which was... Sulk. I played Sulkin, the Mayan calendar, and it had those dials. And I, I played it like almost 10 years ago when it first came out. Eight years ago, I think I looked it up. Eight years ago. And those dials are just not a gimmick. You know, you look into it, and they're fantastic. Not only do they like progress your workers along this track, making them more powerful when you place them there, but it also keeps track of, of uh, the turns of the game. It keeps track of the phases of the game. It's just all around very interesting and compelling uh mechanism it's like you sort of like sometimes you lose track because you know you said okay they're, it's going to take this many turns i'm going to do this and then you realize well now i got to pull back workers so now it's clicked an extra dial and that worker's not where you want it to be anymore and you got to get this really cool you know give and take where you have to some keep some workers in your hand and sort of go back and forth with placing workers loved it played four or five games this week looking forward to playing some more I, I agree with you about the dials. It's absolutely wonderful. And I have to say, if I were even remotely enthusiastic about the overall net effect of, of the game, I would absolutely rush out and get those dials painted because some of the work that people have done to paint those dials really is breathtaking once you get even just a simple shade on those things. And what I really love about the dials as well is that it seeks to remedy some of the issues of worker placement. Generally speaking, one of the problems that you might encounter sometimes in a worker placement game is there's not a whole lot of forward planning involved because you have to be reactive to what other people are doing, which is fine. But in Sulkin, you have to be able to plan. You need to know exactly what a given worker is going to do when you place them. It's like, all right, I'm placing this worker here. Three turns from now, I've got to take that worker back. Otherwise, it's going to slide off into a place where I don't want it to be. Oh, no, I ran out of food. I can't let them sit there that long. Oh, no. That part is wonderful. The only part that I don't like about Sulkin, and it really kills the experience for me, this Sulkin was probably the first game, the first Euro game, where it was tracks on tracks on tracks. I'm like, ugh, tracks. Wait, Don't like the tracks. More on that later. <laughs> that, that being said, exactly what you said, and it's even more so at the near the end of the game where it's like, okay, I have seven turns left, and you can like you you actually have to plan, you know, seven turns ahead of time. Okay, you know, I'm gonna put this out here, put that out there, three advances, and I just love that, you know, forward thinking. It's great, yeah. Can't wait to play more. And you can see where they've pulled ideas for Teo to walk in, and you know, even though it's still more tracks, it's just. You can see where he's got some of his ideas and where he's refined that into Tawakin. It was by the duo of Simone Luciani and Daniela Tashini, which is, they put out so many good games. Honestly, it's a, both individually and together. Some of our favorite designers here at Swag. But again, it's just, it's just the tracks in the buildings don't really do anything for me. It's the core engine, what you're doing with your workers, I adore and it's fabulous. It's just the end result. Uh, well, Mark, do it for me. Mark, you said you love tracks. <laughs> well, I, about, I, I did not say that, Walker. Well, well how about how if you about check the tape? How about tracks? Tracks that is an actual tracks. That is an actual track. And perhaps you may ask, what do you move up this track? Will you move up tracks <laughs> up these tracks? And you might say, well, 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 boy, oh, let me tell you, these tracks are just not what type of tracks. But there's five different tracks moving up these tracks. And you might say, well, whoa, there, that's too many tracks. I but have then no I idea say, what you're talking but about. then I say, no, that's not too many tracks because there's three different tracks that these five tracks can move up. So this means including the industrial track and the turn order track and the victory point track. That's a grand total of 24 tracks in this game. Isn't that amazing? 
This really? is Russian Railroads. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, Russian Railroads so, is very much about tracks on tracks on tracks. In Russian Railroads, there are three different main tracks that you're moving up. And along these three main tracks, you have five different colored tracks that you're moving up this track that represents a track. <laughs> but in all, I this is a game that I had never played before this week. And I really do like it. It's got some very interesting mechanisms. It's got this expendable workers where, you know, because you can get these rubles or coins and really you're not you're not buying anything with these coins there really are just disposable workers you can use these instead of workers there is a spot that you can only use money or rubles but other than that they're just a one-time worker thing and it's got the same sort of thing that the lords of uh, Waterdeep has where it's got this place where you're putting workers for the turn order track that switches the turn order around and then once that's established you get to move that worker into an empty area so you get to sort of reuse it i always thought that was interesting and as you're moving up these tracks, there's all these different bonuses that you're going to start hitting with the different tracks. And some of them require you to be able to hit it with your train as well. So at the beginning, in front of all these tracks, there's these trains that you have to build. So you move the track like eight spaces ahead. You also have to have a value of eight train in order to engage the mechanism. So it's this back and forth. And I really like, I'm looking forward to, you know, indulging even more and getting into this game a little further because... I'm not getting up these tracks very far, Mark. I'm pretty sure you're supposed to get pretty far up all these tracks. I only dimly remember my experience with Russian Railroads. I remember being pleasantly surprised because as the game was being explained to me and I was looking over the board, I was like, I'm going to hate this thing. <laughs> I just expected to be uh, find it utterly painful. I think it was just something about how the tracks were the entirety of the game that made it kind of okay. Or at least I knew that going in. Maybe if I could relearn Sulkin for the first time and someone explained to me, it's like, okay, these buildings, but they're not the point. Actually, no, but then they're the crystal skulls. I think if I were to start drawing a thesis as to what it is I don't like about tracks, I, I, I like it. I'm willing to accept it if that's all you're doing. All you're doing is going up these tracks, and that's effectively everything is in service of that. But once it's it starts to get muddled in with a whole bunch of other victory generation things, it's just, ugh. Yeah, speaking of that, that's the only thing I'm disliking so far is the, the the victory generation thing. It's got these cards, and normally you can just get one. There's other ways you can get a second one, but it's sort of you're going to be picking one out of – there's 10 different victory point cards. So it's sort of got this hidden victory point thing that I hate. You have no idea what the other – the other players are choosing, so there's no you have no idea where you're really standing in the game. So at the sort of the end, there's this huge amount of points that you know are getting dished out. But I think through multiple plays, I'm hoping that will balance out a little bit. Yeah. So here's this game that is track heavy and has hidden end game scoring, which in theory means that between those two things, both of us should loathe it. And yet we're both kind of positive on Russian yes. roads, so it's some sort of miracle. <laughs> It really is. <laughs> well, I'm glad you've been enjoying it. I would try it again with you if you wanted to. For sure. I got to play Through the Desert again. I was commenting, actually, in my review uh, up on, on YouTube that it's really amazing how much productivity that Reiner Knizzi had. I'll just repeat this from my video review. So, Through the Desert, Tigers and Euphrates, A Samurai, Lost Cities, Stevenson's Rocket, Shot and Totten, and Rhinelander. All of those were published within two years of each other. That was 1998-1999. All of those games by Reiner Knizia. That was a good good couple of years. It was a good couple of years. I would happily take that output over the entire catalog of any other living designer. That was am truly amazing. Anyway, I hadn't played Through the Desert in a while. Played it with Dr. Contra. And Through the Desert scales beautifully. I'm not a huge fan of it with 5. I don't think it's at its best with 5, but I'll still happily play it at 5. But Through the Desert is great with 2, 3, or 4. I remembered it in the context of some fervent disagreements that people are having about what games are similar to what games. We have these disagreements often, uh, although I think we can all agree that Through the Desert is basically Mage Knight because it has hexes and exactly. plastic. But I remember the only time I've ever failed to introduce somebody to Through the Desert, because everyone I've shown Through the Desert loves it. It's such a simple game rules-wise, but has such tremendous tactical and strategic depth. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful design. And if you get the multilingual edition, you get to learn eight different translations for Pastel Camel, which is definitely one of your top foreign language necessities. That's true. It is frequently described, and I have frequently described it, as kind of sort of like multiplayer Go in that it is an abstract positional game where territory management and blocking is very important. I made the mistake once, and other people heard me do this, and they didn't stop me, 
of saying it's kind of sort of a little like multiplayer Go to a person who likes Go. Her eyes lit up, and she was immediately enthusiastic. And at the end of the game, just as the game went on, she, she, her face just sank. I was going to say, she, she, you are lucky she didn't slap you. Yeah. Did you enjoy it? It's like, no, it's nothing like Go at all. And I said, what do you mean? It's like, well, you never take pieces. I said, sure, but here are the five ways in which it is similar to Go. It's like, I guess. So <laughs> it's difficult <laughs> to analogize games anyway. Just to just to reemphasize, though, Through the Desert is a brilliant, genuine classic of the hobby. It is absolutely worth tracking down and playing, regardless of whether you like Reiner Concealed or not. If you don't like abstract games, I don't like abstract games very much either, but Reiner Knizia's tiling is just absolutely past master. If you haven't tried all of the so-called tiling trilogy, Through the Desert, Tigers and Freddies and Samurai, you owe it to yourself to, to try them, to try them all. They're so good. They're all so good, Walker. Had a blast playing Through the Desert. Got my got my rear handed to me completely by Dr. Contra. I was completely pantsed, but I still enjoyed it a great, great deal. Because Through the Desert, one of the many, many positive features about it is that despite the fact that it is very confrontational and it is very much about blocking and aggressively maneuvering and posturing and directly stealing points from each other, it still feels family friendly. Nobody gets punched in the face, either figuratively or literally, over a game of Through the Desert. So I highly recommend it. Certainly one of the best tile-laying games ever made. Through the Desert, Ryan Kinsia, check it out. Played Fox and the Forest Duet again. The only reason I'm bringing it up is that I'm really wondering if this is a, a safe. No one's ever played a trick-taking game before. <laughs> trick-taking game. Cloth. If this should be the first one that you introduce them to. Because uh, trick-taking games traditionally are very confrontational. They're very, you know, four players and taking tricks and you want to win all the time. Where, Except when you don't. Except when you don't. But I'm just saying it's, it's usually... a Sometimes a good thing to win tricks, and a lot of them. Sure. And uh, whereas in Fox Force Duet, it's a cooperative. You're sort of talking as much as you can, not saying what you have in your hand, but just sort of explaining the rules as you go. And it's very friendly and nice and cooperative, and it doesn't really give you that feeling of a trick-taking game. So I'm You're assuming... worried that if someone is introduced to this, they will not develop the killer instinct. Exactly. And they will sit down to a game of bridge or something. And they will look over and say, should I be winning this trick? Why don't you take this trick? Do you want to take this trick? Yeah, exactly. They'll be wondering what's going on. Why are these people so aggressive? And (laughs) why am I losing so badly? But I still love Fox and the Force Duet. Such a great game. Very fun. And I'm glad I had fun playing it again. That being said, I need to up the difficulty. I don't think I've lost a game of Fox and the Force Duet yet. This was close this time, but have yet to lose. We're going to have to flip the board over and play the other side. Well, I've never played by the proper rules, so I couldn't comment. So. Oh, you mean proper rules? <laughs> <laughs> it's almost as though we should have, you know, used the little reference card that came with it. I'm not <laughs> saying. I'm just saying. I played Shards of Infinity, Shadow of Salvation. I commented last week that the, the career trajectory of Justin Gary is an interesting one in that he designed a miniatures game I really liked then helped design an evolution to deck building that I really like. And then he designed a deck builder with miniatures elements that I didn't really like. Instead, I like the other deck builder that he most recently designed, namely Shards of Infinity. So I decided to go back to the the Justin Gary deck builder that I really like. I played a solo game. The first expansion to Shards of Infinity introduced a solo variant, which is very clean, which is nice. And still lets you play with the cards and experiment with card combos and do all this thing. It is much too easy, and it is also much too random. For example, I could conceive of a very, very unusual card setup where you would be unable to win. But it is overwhelmingly more likely that you're just going to have a very, very easy time of it. Because every time I've played the solo version, it's been borderline trivial, which is a bit of a problem. But you still get all the pleasant deck builder elements of... of As I say, trying out new card combos and and getting to play with the market and things like that. I am very disappointed that I have not yet had a chance to try the major new element of the second expansion, namely Shadow of Salvation, which is the co-op version. Because the co-op version cannot be played solitaire unless you're willing to play multi-handed. And despite the fact that Shards of Infinity is a very, very, very simple game and very straightforward, it is indeed one of those incredibly clean deck builders that I call sort of the realms tradition of deck builders. I'm not willing to do it multi-handed. And so I have to remember, uh, now that we are gaming in person again, to try the co-op uh, campaign because it's got a little bit of a choose-your-own-adventure book with, with campaigns and you go fight this silly far-future sci-fi boss and you fight this other silly far-future sci-fi boss. 
And I'd, I'd like to give it a try because I literally have no idea how good it is. It's all a function of these AI cards that are keyed to both the, the boss and uh, specific elements. So you're going to have a different AI deck every time. And it could be good. It could be bad. I'm looking for, I, I definitely want to give it a try because I, I missed, I remember Star Realms, the, the cooperative there was pretty well done. It was like fun to like sort of deck build together and sort of, you know, go up against stuff. The Hero Realms, we we had a little bit of trouble with, but it was... Yeah, one of the scenarios was just bad. The concept, you know, was was interesting, but yeah, so I'm looking... Uh, that would be fun to try again. Absolutely. And that was Shards of Infinity, Shadow of Salvation. And finally for me, I played a lot of Terraforming Mars online, but it was all against AI, and we finally got to try it with uh, the group. So there was three of us playing Terraforming Mars. And I just want to say it just moves so much faster when you play this online version because it does all the shuffling and the, the draft and the, you know, you know, passing cards around and, and just make sure that there's no mistakes, you know, moving the, all the, the cubes around and making sure you spend all your, you know, actions and not forget anything. And I think just all around is just a much pleasant experience. And I'm really hoping that they're going to start putting some of the expansions in. That would be super fun. I was about to ask, have they put none of the expansions none. in? Wow. Just the base game so far. Huh. That surprises me. It does. It has to do something with sales, right? Maybe the sales weren't as good as they thought, or maybe they're just, you know, working on it. Who knows? Or maybe the sales were good enough. They figured they didn't have to bother. Who's to maybe. say? <laughs> Who's to say? Finally played another game of Cthulhu Death May Die. This is a game we reviewed not too long ago, and again, the reaction at the end of the game was very characteristic. There was uh, the person I was playing with said, huh, I was expecting it to be a lot longer, what with all this plastic. And this was not meant as a pejorative. It was not sort of anticlimactic. It's just, wow, that was, you know, that was a 60-minute game, despite that there's all these giant minis flying all over the place. And there's been a lot of feedback on our review of Cthulhu Death May Die. I have to say that it is telling that despite the fact that we reviewed it very recently, I wanted to go back to it relatively soon, which is a testament to, again, how simple and clean everything is. And one of the comments that people have raised is, oh, well, it's not really all that clean. But usually I find that that is in reference to the scenario with fire. And I've played the scenario with fire several times, but it is definitely the minority of playings. But that's the tricky thing with scenario-based games, right? A lot of people are going to try it maybe once or twice, and if they don't like it, they're not going to keep coming back to it, which is perfectly reasonable. We do the same thing all the time, except when we do a, a feature review. Then, of course, we go back whether we like whether, whether we want to or not, because we are willing to sacrifice ourselves on the altar exactly. of, of criticism. It's the sacrifice we make for our listeners, Mark. Absolutely. Well, I do it because I hate myself, and I do it also because I hate you. But but it really is a tragedy when a game does not lead with its best foot forward. And I have to say, just as a sort of coda to our previous review, I don't think that Death May Die does a very good job of leading with its best foot forward. Because probably what a lot of people are going to do is they're going to play Episode 1, Natch, and they're, they might play it against Cthulhu, because, you know, he's the guy on the front of the box. He, he, he's, he's the big draw. And that is not, I would say, one of the better two-thirds of scenarios that I played as uh, F. Cthulhu Death May Die. I mean, personally, if I were in charge of the universe, I would say that the first scenario should be the one where you're beaming up moose to UFOs, but that's just not an option. <laughs> and again, it's a tragedy that that's Kickstarter exclusive. And I have to say that this has made me reflect generally on the effect of fire in a lot of games like this. It's almost always bad. I'm not going to say that it's as bad as, say, skip a turn or stun elements, but it effectively has a lot of the same effects. I remember uh, playing The Other's Seven Sins, which, parenthetically, has a number of similarities with Cthulhu Death May Die, despite not being a strict co-op. And one of my key problems was that there are all these fires and blights that go everywhere on the board that encourage you not to move. And I don't want games to be static. I don't want games to penalize me for doing something. And so Cthulhu Death May Die doesn't do that. Except with respect to fire, which of which there's a lot in the first scenario. So, so my sincere recommendation, actually, for those that ha that are inclined to give the game a shot but haven't, skip the first scenario. Not necessarily for all time, but I'm saying if you want to experience it for its clean, streamlined best, do not start with the first scenario. And if all you've played was the first scenario and you thought, "Wow, this might be a good game," shame about all this fire. Maybe you might want to try episode two. Yeah, just to touch on the feedback that we got, it just makes me glad that I don't consume any other media. <laughs> on board games. No, I'm just being serious. Sure. Apparently there's a problem with a lot of people thought that the map tiles were were too small or whatever and I just I just didn't feel that whatsoever and I thought it, I thought maybe if I had read something about that or or someone had said something then I would have you know thought that as well, you know what I sure. mean? And and so I'm just glad like I said I don't I don't listen or or watch anything else. Fair enough. 
That was Cthulhu Death May Die. Now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. Well, there's a fantastic movie called The Princess Bride. They're going to come out with a game called The Princess Bride Adventure Book Game by Ryan Miller, who's done all sorts of stuff. He does all sorts of IP stuff. He also did the Lord of the Rings collectible miniature game and the UFS fighter game, all sorts of... If you look through his catalog, he's done tons of IP stuff, but it's coming out by Ravensburger, so I'm hoping that will counterdict the IP and it will actually be good. <laughs> It sounds like it's, uh, even before, it's, this is echoed in the forums, but I, I wrote this down before I even read any of the forums. It's, it's, it, it, it looks like it plays a lot like the Lord of the Rings, uh, Rhino Knizia's Lord of the Rings game, where everyone's gonna have a hand of cards and you're playing cards to move the main characters. No one actually controls one of the main characters. You all sort of cooperatively move them around to strategic points of, of these maps that continually change like Lord of the Rings and it's all in the book. They're doing the same sort of thing where you open the book and you play right on the pages. I see. So that's why it's called the storybook game. Yeah. And so you're going to be putting the, you have to get them in strategic places and play certain cards. So it sounds though it's going to play out a little bit like Lord of the Rings, but looking forward, hopefully it's going to do well. And that is Princess Bride by Ravensburger. So Capstone Games has put out a number of very successful games, but they have this Iron Rails series. It started with Irish Gage. I've talked about this in the podcast before. Absolutely fabulous Tom Russell Cube Rails game. They've also put out an edition of Ride the Rails, which is by always controversial designer John Borer. I have not tried it. The third game in the Iron Rail series is going to be Iberian Gage, which is also going to be by Tom Russell. And I am very keen to try it. This was originally put out by Winsome Games, again, by the very controversial John Borer. And Winsome Games tended to be very, very, very small, bespoke, handmade print runs. But more and more Winsome Games have been republished. The most famous example of this was probably Chicago Express back in the day, which was a, a reprint of Wabash Cannonball by Queen Games. But Capstone is now going back to the catalog of Winsome Games over and over again for the Iron Rail series. And I, for one, am a fan because some of those designs are really good. Now, some of them were just incredibly bizarre and not necessarily ready for a wider audience. But Tom Russell knows what he's doing. And he's also a very, very interesting guy. And he has also a very interesting publisher. But, so I'm looking forward to trying Iberian Gage. All right. So Stefan Feld put out a game called uh, Castles of Burgundy. Now there's going to be a Castles of Tuscany. And it seems to be somewhat similar. It's like a... Wait, 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 wait. Two Stefan Feld games being somewhat similar? I know. Madness, I'm sure. So I've read the rules. And it, it feels to me, just from a rules reading, that it's a very streamlined version of Castles of Burgundy with a focus on the combos. Like when, you know, when you put down the buildings and their combos happen when you put these buildings down. So it seems as though they it's focused more on that because there's much less of the marketplace where you're buying all these buildings. It's more of just playing cards, to put out certain colors and, and getting the combos to go off and making those actions better because you can, you know, make them, you know, drawing more cards, placing more tiles, stuff like that. So anyway, sounds like it's going to be great. I'm going to pick it up. It's by Alia Games, Castles of Tuscany. Looking forward to giving it a try. Next up is Cloud Age by Alexander Pfister and Capstone Games. Uh, they've said it's going to be lighter than Macarbo. And it's going to be this uh, post-apocalyptic, you know, the oil wells have all been destroyed or dried up and bad stuff happens. And it's got this hidden sort of... They call it a sleeving mechanism. A sleeving I don't really mechanism know what that means. for resources in the clouds. I think it's going to hide some information, but not all of it. And so you got to sort of predict what it's going to be and sort of invest that way. Yeah, it sounded it sounded like it had potential. Yeah. I, would, I would trust Fister to handle hidden information like that properly, so it didn't feel like some sort of random crap. Yeah, thing. at first when I read sleeves, I thought it was going to be like another Mister. Yeah, like a John I, Clare, so yeah. I was like, okay, okay, now I'm going to have to read more. But anyway, <laughs> thankfully it is not. Another thing that's coming up is Teotihuacan. It's called, strangely enough, it's called the Expansion Period. Yet another expansion for your Teotihuacan. I'm not going to go over everything that's in it. It's just more stuff. More, more modular expansions. Yeah, more characters, more. And the, well, the one thing that's interesting is this is that now there's going to be spaces between the spaces, but on those spaces, you go counterclockwise as opposed to clockwise. Ooh. That strikes me as the kind of thing that could be really cool or tremendously <laughs> confusing. Yes. Because clockwise and counterclockwise are so simple and atomistic, but sometimes even very, very clever people who are very spatially aware, and I'm going to talk about myself here, I, I don't think I'm either of those two things necessarily, get very confused about clockwise. <laughs> Agreed. Minor correction from last week. 
I misspoke when I was talking about Ash's Rise of the Phoenixborn. The rights have not in any way been transferred from Plat Hat Games. Team Covenant is exclusively in charge of distribution. Plat Hat is still in charge of the development, and they still own the IP. We apologize for the mistake, and we apologize to the people involved. Thank you very much for pointing that out. And lastly, for me, just two quick uh, bits of Kickstarter news. There's a game called Sniper Elite. I'm going to have to read the rulebook before I have to say too much on this, but it seems to be a lot like Spectre Ops. You're going to be the sniper, World War II, infiltrating a German base, and it looks like there's going to be two phases where one's like sneaking around, doing stuff. The other, you know, once, you know, we raise the alarm or stuff, you're going to start shooting people. Secret movement might be interesting. It's up on Kickstarter. But like I said, it's one of these things where the rule book's going to make or break it for sure for me. Is this going to be, is this another 1v all game where the one is the quote unquote good guy? Yes. Interesting. And the, the, the all are actually like little pockets. Like instead of just being one, like in Spectre Ops where it's like one, it's like little units and you can move the units around. I see. Might be interesting. Lastly or not, I flip flopped on this thing, Mark. It was, it's called the board game designer kit, right? So I say, oh, I'm going to dump all over this, right? (laughs) <laughs> you know, you know, you order your designer kit and you learn how to, you know, design a board game. And then I watched the video and it says, you know, well, when you have children and you want to make a board game with them. And and then it's like, no, I'm dumping all over this. If you don't, <laughs> if you don't, if I'm just saying, if you don't already have enough bits and stuff in order to design a board game, don't. <laughs> like, I'm being serious. Like, if you don't have enough you know, leftover bits from expansions or, or, or games you don't play anymore or games that got destroyed or just bits lying around. If you don't already have this stuff, then you probably should not design a board game. But is this, is this, okay. 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 <laughs> no, I'm serious. Is it, it uh, <laughs> is this meant to be an activity that you do with your children? No, no, no. It's a straight up board game designer. Cause that was a subset. Okay. This was a subsection of it. Okay. It was like, it was like, okay. Or, or do you have this child that enjoys, you know, do you want to, you know, further their imagination? And that was like, you know, about two seconds of the video and the rest was, you know, design your own board game type thing. And you know, I've had it. I'm done with it. Okay. Just because you, you, you like board games doesn't mean you should design one. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Over here in the non-gatekeeping section of the hobby, I have uh, a mild entreaty with respect to the United States Postal Service. We get political on occasion in this uh, on this podcast, but never partisan, and I'm going to try to maintain that tone. Walker will whack me upside the head if I deviate too, too far from that. I've had extensive experience with the USPS. I've engaged in well over 400 trades on uh, uh, board games over my time on Board Game Geek, and the overwhelming majority of those has been shipped through the USPS. And I have more or less nothing but good things to say about the United States Postal Service, especially in comparison to Canada Post. I'm not blaming anyone. Servicing Canada is much more difficult as a mail carrier. We have a smaller population and a larger geography to cover. Absolutely, 100%. But in terms of quality of service, reliability of delivery, the USPS has been astounding. There is a concerted effort to undermine the proceedings of the USPS. There have been an effort to decommission post boxes. There's been an effort to clamp down on overtime, which has led to mail backups. This is already exacerbating a lot of the pressures that exist because of COVID. There were already slowdowns before this, but now there's a concerted effort to hollow out the USPS. If you're a gamer, you should care about this because the USPS probably has been involved at some point in your hobby life. I can definitely attest that in my uh, my hobby life, it has been a large part of my hobby life and it has facilitated a lot of my hobby life. And once the border is open again, sometime in 2025, probably, it will once again be a major part of my hobby life. And so I hope it is healthy and survives that long. So if you care about the USPS, I sincerely recommend that you notify your elected representatives that you care about the USPS. Inform yourself. And that is the news and why it doesn't matter. Now, on to our feature game, which is Eclipse 2nd Edition. So Eclipse 2nd Dawn for the Galaxy was kickstarted and came out this year, 2020. Eclipse New Dawn for the Galaxy, i.e. 1st Edition, came out in 2011, all of nine years ago. And at the time, it's important to remember that 4X games, that is to say, typically sci-fi games of exploration, expansion, exploitation, and extermination, those are the 4Xs, nominally, I have some quibbles with the terminology, which we'll get to later, that Twilight Imperium was, if not the dominant 4X game, it was definitely the dominant paradigm of 4X games. 
very, 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 very long, usually player count intensive games. You know, six plus players, six plus hours. And when Ex- Eclipse was first released in 2011, it was an attempt to kind of Euroify the genre. It hadn't really been done then, and it was released kind of at the height of the great culture wars between the Ameritrash and Eurogames, which has mostly died down with the great... The singularity. The great singularity. Now, it was it was uh, designed and published by uh, a Finnish group called uh, Laura Pellet, and designed by, I'm going to mispronounce this, Toko Takokalio. My sincere apologies to everyone who lives in Finland. And his design pedigree involves a number of Euro games that were released roughly at the same time, you know, to, uh, 2010 to around 2012 or 2013, among the uh, Prinky Pato and Walnut Grove. I haven't played a lot of his other outputs. Uh, mostly his design pedigree consists of Eclipse and a whole bunch of Eclipse expansions. So far, there is only one expansion to the Second Dawn for the Galaxy, namely the box of Kickstarter exclusives, but that's about it. So, Walker, why don't you give us an unhelpful summary about what one does in Eclipse Second Dawn for the Galaxy? He's limbering up, folks. I, I tell you, gonna... In Eclipse, you play a unique faction, which you will be personally invested in by customizing your own ships. Developing your own text to get you better at gathering, better in combat, better at exploring the galaxy in which you're going to evolve your civilization and then help them colonize space and lead them to a prosperous future. (laughs) (laughs) I wish this was all true, Mark, but that is not what you do in Eclipse Second Edition. Instead, in, Cle- in Eclipse Second Edition, you're racing out to explore, trying to capture the most resources like some sort of plague to grab up <laughs> development tokens that will hopefully rocket you into the lead. Do you waste your time on actions trying to slow other players down? That's crazy talk. <laughs> Just spread out and build up for the last turn showdown where you try and hold on to what you got or go on the attack to try to squeak out those last few victory points by attacking the leader. Yeah, there's a lot there. And I have to say, I can't really disagree with much of it, except perhaps slightly in terms of tone. Just to put all my cards on the table. For me, my approach to Eclipse, and it has been for some years now, is Eclipse is basically an attempt to answer a fundamental question. How much are you willing to forgive for a singular and unique game element that you haven't seen repeated nearly so well anywhere else? And for me, with respect to Eclipse, that is ship design. The ability to design your own ships and watching those ships interact with other ship designs and all of the nested elements that influence that, your information pipeline, your resources pipeline, your tactical positioning on the map, all of that feeds into just this this dance of unique ship designs. All the rest of it, even the stuff that's well designed, I could take or leave at best. Some of it I actively dislike. But man, I have not seen that element of ship design and customization done nearly so well anywhere else. So there, there wasn't the other Exodus. They do the same sort of thing, do they not? Not nearly so well. Not, not nearly as well. But not near. No. Well, look, there are lots of games where you customize your units. I mean, look, deck builders are basically about customizing a unit, arguably. And yes, Ex- Exodus, Proximus, and Tori, and any game where you have this element of research. And indeed, that's that's the term that's often missing in 4X. People talk about 4X games, and you know they, they talk about the 4Xs. But to me, one of the defining elements of a 4X game is that it needs to have research. You need to have new technologies. You need to be able to research stuff. Now, how that works, of course, can differ, and different games approach it in very different ways. But if somebody designed a 4X game and said, this is a 4X game, and there was no research and no technology, I wouldn't necessarily start insisting on rigid taxonomies, but I'm like, huh, that's a little weird, because normally it's one of the key elements that, that, that that's part of the genre. And yeah, when I was reading about Exodus Proxima Centauri, I was hoping that it was going to give me some of that bits. But honestly, the level of personality, the level of detail, the level of asymmetry that you get in the ships of Eclipse, honestly, is heads and shoulders above any other kinds of similar game. What it reminds me of is back in the day when I quote-unquote played Battletech. And I say quote-unquote played Battletech because mostly what I did with respect to Battletech was I designed mechs. That's mostly what I did. I The amount of time that I spent designing mechs was easily twice to five times as much as I uh, spent playing Battletech. Agreed. And that was the fun stuff for me. And when I get to fiddle with, with these ship designs, and more importantly, watch these ship designs engage with the meta of other people's ship designs, and the meta of the the... AI controlled ships that aren't controlled by any player. That's what I absolutely adore about Eclipse. 
And as a result, I'm still willing to play it, even though there's a whole bunch of things that, uh, some of which you mentioned, and you didn't even mention the one thing that I hate the most about Eclipse. Oh, I, haven't, I haven't got there yet. It'll come up. Don't worry. Okay, okay. Well, come just, up. We said a summary, right? I didn't want to you yeah, know, yeah. do the whole review but, all in the first paragraph. Fair enough. But just, but just to summarize already, I am still willing to play Eclipse almost purely because of the sheer quality and engagement involved in the ship design. I agree with you 100%. Like that might, of course, it came off as completely negative. Sure, but I will play this eclipse at the drop of a hat because it is that great. I'm going to start off with the components, Mark. Mm. The components are fantastic, especially compared to the uh, the first edition. Like with the upgrade tray and the tech tray. The old in the old one, it was just a you know piece of cardboard. You put all the text in on it. You couldn't hand that around. Now with these new trays, you pass it around the table. They can look at it when it's not their turn. They can be ready. They're not getting up and looking over or just disregarding completely because they're sick of, you know, having to go up and look at it. Same with the tech thing. You know, you had all different people had different ways of doing it. Plano things, whatever, trying to find it. People would put them GMT back. counter trays for Yeah, me. they'd put them back in the wrong space. Anyway, long story short, these new trays are fantastic. The new player boards, how everything locks into place. You know, keeping track of your cubes and your economy, super easy now. The fact that there's different ships for every race, the way the orbitals and the monoliths look, the way the new neutral ships look, the galactic center defense system, the giant thing in the middle. This all brings it together and everyone gets these little booklets. So even if, you know, they don't know what certain texts do, they can look it up. They're not bothering, you know, one person with the rule book all the time. Everything is there. I would classify some of the component up I would classify the component upgrades into roughly two categories. There's the quality of life improvements, which there were absolutely tons of things you could do as a user to mitigate, but nonetheless it's things that as a user you had to do to mitigate. Things like the player aids, things like having the technology board, things like having a counter tray for the upgrades. And then there's the stuff that is just really visually appealing. I'm thinking of the new minis for the Ancients. I'm thinking of the the new mini for the Galactic Center Defense System. I'm thinking of the fact that each individual territory tile is embossed with uh, UV coating. I don't care about UV coating on a box, because I don't look at the box when I'm playing. But the tiles look really nice with the, the UV embossing and things like that. Uh, it is, it, it's a very, very compelling package. It's super expensive. It took them forever to fulfill. The Kickstarter was a bit of a mess. The, the exclusivity is a mess. It's uncertain when, when and how any of this is going to get to retail. But honestly, you see the result of these products. And this is the first time when I can point to a thing loaded with game trays and not say, yeah, but all of it works. All of it's great. I, some, some of it is stuff that I didn't feel the need for just, just as a, as, as a minor, as a minor note, like the fact that the player boards are now effectively in two units. There's the player board for the race, and then there's your cubes for managing resources. I didn't mind, in fact, slightly preferred that they were all in one place before, because I could get a unified view of what my economy was like. I didn't have to look over here to see my cost and over there to see my income. But that's a that's a super minor quibble, and a number of other people really, really enjoy the fact that you can now manage the space better. It's It's a very impressive physical design. When these both came out, they're uh, compared a lot together, uh, Twilight Imperium in this game. I'm going to make very few uh, comparisons, but just the flow of the game, the fact that it goes around the table, the actions are very small and defined, and there's no real uh, you know, end of round like there is in, in Twilight Imperium where there's like a political round and, and, and the you know, there's so many different phases that bog the game down. This is, you know, you, you know, pay for the actions more on that later. You just pay for the actions that you took that turn and you sort of reset and you're ready to go put out some new techs and you're into the next turn already. And when it is your turn, you're just exploring. When you explore, you just like add a map tile. Maybe you're putting a development tile on it. Maybe you're putting an alien ship. Very simple. You're just getting it done. Upgrade and research. You just say you're doing it. You're doing it while it's someone else's turn. And then there's the movement. No one does that, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah, it, most of the time it's very much like Scythe. You declare what you're doing, and it matters to other people, but then you can just keep going and going. And I will say one thing, though, about the the, the, the turn structure, and then I'd like to cycle back to the nature of the actions, and specifically as a comparison to Twilight Imperium. I, I've i commented before that I strongly prefer it when the battles happen during the round and when the timing is under the control of the players. I'm thinking specifically of things like Blood Rage, things like Thulu Wars, instead of a situation like Eclipse where all the fights get keyed up to the end of the round. Now, I know why it works that way. You need to be able to give the defender a chance to reinforce and do other things. It's the game's betterment. 
but I nonetheless prefer it when the structure is a little more dynamic. That having been said, as you say, the structure is pretty free flowing. Yeah, even in combat, right? Because they they every sector is numbered, so you just start at the highest one, you work down, and we're going to probably talk about the tech more. But the tech will tell you how many dice you're rolling and what color they are. You roll them, you need sixes. Stuff modifies that, and you're done. And I really like how that works. Well, combat is where you see all of this stuff come together, right? Because I've talked before just to touch again on how much we love the ship customization. The ship customization is kind of seeing your designs on parade and finding out that that ship design that you thought was amazing has a fatal flaw that is now being exploited by someone else's clever ship design or finding out that that ship design that was incredibly good two turns ago is now completely out of step with the current meta of technology and now just isn't able to get it done. So in in a way I find the actual mechanism of combat, which again, it's just mostly just, a fair amount of dice. I, I prefer it if there were a little more dice to even out the probability curve a little bit more, but it's, it's, it's enough. That is, is taking a back seat. To me, it's just the resolution phase of how well did you build your ships? Yeah, and I love the fact that you can design them however you want. You can make those glass cannons that you wanted. You can make those tanks that you want. You can just do it however you like, and I just love that part about the game. And there's enough technological variety in terms of the shipbuilding, and indeed sometimes even technological variety in the non-ship parts that in turn influence the kind of ships that you want to build, which is absolutely great. It's not just a function of glass cannon versus tank. It's also about how fast do you want your ship to be? How quick do you want your ship to be? Those are two different things. How good you are in initiative order and how far you're able to move. How easy you are to hit. How good you are at hitting. Do you want missile boats? Do you want high damage cannons? Do you want lots of low damage cannons? There, All of these things are influenced by, again, the meta of what ships are doing, what you want your ships to do. And all this stuff's not always available. So that's another thing about tech. There's three different categories that you can put this tech into. And this, all of this stuff is not always available. There's going to be like, in a four-player game, this varies on number of players. There's going to be like 14 tiles drawn and then seven every turn. So some techs aren't even going to be there. Some are. And this is where a turn order comes, you know, fairly important. Maybe too important. That's, you know, to someone's opinion. And these texts are going to disappear before you can get to them, or, you know, there's going to be tons there. It's it's this interesting economy of technology that you have to try to get before other people do, or, you know, see what's there and get what's important when it's there. And that randomness, I find perfectly fine. It just influences the contours of what texts are available. One game might be determined by a whole bunch of missile boats. But another game might not have the missiles come out at all, and so it's just not going to be an influence on the meta regardless. So in in effect, you can't come into a game determined to build a very, very, very specific ship design. You can have thoughts about what kind of ship you would like to build in broad strokes, but you can't be committed to specific details. And there, I've never played a game of Eclipse where the random technology draw had a negative effect on the game. It was always just determining the contours of what it is that you could research. And it's interesting how uh, your technologies get cheaper as you build more into a certain category. Category, that particular category gets cheaper and cheaper. And I thought that was a kind of interesting twist. And it leads to victory points at the end. Yeah, it encourages specialization in one way. And at the same time, in order to balance the effects, you might be pulled in a different way. So sometimes when you're shopping for a tech, it's not just how does this feed into the strategy that I've developed, but sometimes it's also, oh, but this other one, although not as appealing, is super cheap and will give me points at the end of the game. So that little that little element of tension I really like. So let's circle back to the actual actions. So I have this thing, it's called actions versus economy. So as it goes around the table, everyone's taking these actions and they're putting discs over on their player board saying what action they're taking. And as they're taking them off, that the turn for them is becoming more and more expensive because it'll tell you the cost of the disc that you're taking off the one side. And as you bring it over, so it sort of limits you to how many actions you can take or how much chances or how much you want to push your economy or your civilization. And I really love that part about the game. And it dovetails also with uh, a very, very thematic element, which is as your empire gets larger, as you control more and more hexes, that puts a further strain on that self-same resources, the discs. The resources that you used to take actions are the same resources that you put out on the map to claim control. So at the start of the game, when you don't have many financial commitments and you don't have anything to run, you can be a little bit more reactive. But if you're committed to holding a lot of hexes throughout most of the game, that will put a damper on things and can possibly cause you to have some problems. Which, and just to circle back to something you said about how smooth the actions are, and again, to contrast with Twilight Imperium. When I play a game of Twilight Imperium, there are a lot of systems 
system barriers to what I can do, right? You can't research attack. That role was taken. You can't influence turn order. That's, that role has been taken. Everything is, it, it, it's weird. They decided to take the Euro elements that were specifically designed around throttling what actions you could do when they Euroified Twilight Imperium. On the other hand, Eclipse is very, very smooth. Just one resource gives you actions, one resource lets you build things, and one resource lets you research. If you can't do something, it's just because you can't afford it, because you don't have the resources. Not because there's a game stricture telling you you're not allowed to. And for me, in terms of freedom, that definitely makes me feel like I'm much more in control of my own fate. All right, well, since we're doing the comparison, I'm going to circle back to combat when I compare it to Twilight Imperium. And the fact that in Eclipse, it just seems you're doing combat to hold dirt. Um, because in Twilight Imperium, there's all sorts of abilities that might give you victory points or hidden objectives or all sorts of different things that will push you into combat. You have all sorts of reasons in Twilight Imperium in order to go into combat. Whereas in Eclipse, like even though you're going to draw some tokens from the bag, it'll say, oh, you're in combat. You get to draw to see what happens. You know, you draw three ones. You're the attacker. You won. You draw three tokens. You get to pick one. Oh, you draw three ones. The loser draws one. And he draws a four. He gets four victory points. You get one. It's, you know, out of this random bag. It's not always going to happen that way. But, I mean, it's just the fact that, long story short, it makes a lot more sense in Twilight Imperium to get into combat than it does in in Eclipse, I on, on paper, Eclipse does everything right in terms of encouraging early combat. That's one of the reasons why they knocked down the number of rounds for what it's worth. They, they wanted, rather than nine rounds with low resources, they just bumped up the resources a bit and put it to eight rounds because they said, well, look, we noticed that most conflict happens near the end anyway, so why don't we just shorten things? The system encourages early combat because this bag of victory tiles is just better the earlier you are in the game. Now, yes, there's randomness, and you might get do better later on in the game with fewer draws than earlier with more draws, but, you know, all things being equal. The problem is, and I played Eclipse, both first and second edition, with a number of different groups, and in theory, this will incentivize early skirmishes, which is good for a game like this. Testing out more ship designs, lots of early conflicts rather than big, drawn-out conflicts near the end. In practice, in effect, I have not seen it manifest properly. Even with groups that are less averse to conflict, groups that are willing to engage in fights and not consider it a, a, a tremendous insult to your honor for a minor attack on turn two, they still, I don't know what it is, and I think it's largely by virtue of the other systems, do not in, take advantage oh, of early minor aggression. Enough. I was about to say, that's exactly what it is. They can see the fact that you need to build your economic engine. And if you are wasting actions on A, Building ships, B, moving, these are all discs you're taking off your track and cost you money that you're not using to explore and increase that engine. I'm not willing to concede that it's a bad call. All that I'm willing to concede is that for whatever reason, despite the fact that I can see some good design decisions to encourage a better emergent game state, I have yet to see that better emergent game state manifest the way that they wanted it to. Shall, can we talk about exploration? We can. I hate the exploration. I hate it so I much. Hate it. I hate it so much. I have... It is awful. It's fantastic, Mark. No. What do you mean? You get these discovery tokens that are so swingy, it's painful. Well, that's when you get them, right? It's it's their <laughs> availability. Yes. Plus their availability and randomness. Like so so you're going to be A flipping over tiles that may or may not have these discovery tokens on them, and they may or not may or may not be guarded by the ancients. And then you're flipping them over and they may or may not be any good to you. It is crazy. I don't... Uh, honestly, I don't mind the discovery tokens quite so much, even though sometimes an early discovery token pick will establish a ship class dominance for much of the game, if not entirely yeah, of the game. I, I'm willing to forgive even that. Let me just touch this one part. Okay. You're talking because you're talking probably about the ancient ship parts. Yeah, there's, no, the discovery ship parts. The, yeah, there, there are... Some discoveries are ship parts. Yeah, they're ship parts. And one, it's a free tech, yes. which would take you two actions to normally get one you'd have to research it two you'd have to take an upgrade in order to put it on your ship three it's at no cost you're not spending and many of them are just flatly better than a lot of other techs yes it makes them ridiculously powerful getting the right one at the right time absolutely and sometimes they're not useful and so who cares the thing that i hate though even more than that because there's uh, discovery tokens at least are fun you get a discovery, it's like, ooh, I can take this or take two points, ooh, what's it going to be? That part, at least it's fun, everyone gets to look around it, even when it's not fair, something fun is happening. The key problem is, as I've said, money gives you actions, science gives you tech, and minerals give you ships. If you're starved for research or minerals, you can just save up for a future turn, you know, you can get a bigger buy later, whatever, you can kind of ignore it. If you're starved for money, 
you have to skip turns. That's what you have to do. You have to pass. You have to pass earlier than you would want to be. And you can end up in a hole. If you cannot get a good enough economy going in the early turns because the tiles you flip don't give that to you, you are going to be behind the eight ball. And this is a game of compounding interest. Hey, we'll call that the Walker hole. Yeah, it's the Walker hole. Uh, Walker, I would just like to point out that Walker won our last game despite the fact that he's going to be complaining endlessly about how he doesn't get the good discovery tiles and he doesn't have the good economy. No, wah, wah, no wah. I'm, I'm, I'm 100% that last game we played i got everything that was good it was fantastic <laughs> discovery tiles were sure. fantastic the, the 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 system tiles that i flipped over were fantastic but the game before that not so much allow me to issue a generalization that is probably overbroad but it is definitely what i'm thinking at this moment when the fundamental driver of a game engine is random that is going to undermine game balance and quality decision making it's the same problem that we had with Nemesis, right? You flip over a tile. Is it the tile you need or is it not the tile you need? Oh, better go keep looking elsewhere in a game where you might be able to est establish your victory conditions on turn two, or you might never be able to find it because you just couldn't spend enough time getting to the other side of the map. Contrast this with something like Mage Knight, which, I mean, they both have hexes, so they're both fundamentally the same game. Mage Knight is, again, more kind of like the random tech draw. The random tiles are going to determine the contours of what you're able to do. But you're never going to flip over a tile in Mage Knight and not have something to go stomp on. It's just how you need to stomp on them. As opposed to something like Eclipse, where you might be desperately searching for more economic planets and you just cannot get them. This is on top of the fact, compounding this... We t we've talked a little bit about how the system really wants to encourage lots of player interaction and player conflict at the right times. But the explore draws compound this further because being able to connect the map properly, namely being able to interact with the players on the terms you want to, especially since some races do not want to fight and some races desperately wish to fight. Sometimes the tile draws you get will not allow you, literally will not allow you to connect parts of the map. And as a result, you can have a player cordoned off in their little corner. Yes, there are some techs that help mitigate this. They might come out, they might not. Maybe you can get them, maybe you can't. But I don't like it when the best case scenario sometimes is, oh, you can go stomp on the turtling race by spending your hard-earned resources to compensate for bad explore draws. That's just blaming the victim and asking them to lose more because the fundamental driver of Eclipse at the core of it is how good were your explore poles in rounds one and two? The thing that I've heard people ex explain is, well, you know, Mark, your, your one objection solves the other. If you get bad explore poles in rounds one and two, go stomp and conquer the good explore poles that your neighbor got. Again, that's blaming the victim and expecting me, who has a crippled economy in the opening rounds, to go spend my valuable actions, which I may or may not have to spare, and uh, my science and my rock, which I may or might not have because these planets might be incredibly terrible to go take it. And also this is on top of the fact that although the combat in Eclipse is very fun, taking dirt is really strange and awkward because after you kill all the ships, you then have to do planetary bombardment, which is this weird other thing. It's not quite combat. It's a little bit like combat and it's very awkward until you get neutron bombs. So all I have to do as the person who had terrible exploration luck is go get the right text with the money that I don't have and then go and get the proper results from the economy that I don't have. Ugh. I hate, I hate that part of it so I much. Hate it. And I hate that I have to deal with that part to get to all the stuff that's so incredibly awesome. It's so true. So some things they changed from first edition. Yes. The fact that when you pass, you get two economy, like we said. So That's nice. That's if, just really if, good. If you got bad draws, I guess you can start passing. So you get $2. It, look, it's something. I prefer... <laughs> I miss the, the the part that was introduced in one of the two expansions for Eclipse, where the second player to pass determines where play is clockwise or counterclockwise. That's something that you can easily introduce. And in the Kickstarter exclusives, there's the turn order variant, where the order of play is fixed by who the order of who passes. So if you pass second, you're going to be playing second, as opposed to, yay, I'm sitting to the left of the person who passed first. I'm only going to go over the ones that, you know, that are interesting. Like the fact that we've already talked about it, it's only eight rounds instead of nine the biggest difference to me, and this is something that I, I was able to experiment with before second edition was released, is the aggressive rebalancing. So many techs have had their cost change. So many ship parts have had their effects changed. And so many of the systems have been tinkered with. And I have to say, all my complaints about the nature of good systems versus bad systems, meaning the systems you need versus the systems you don't, much worse in the first edition than in the second. They've done a very good job of leveling out the field so that there are fewer truly epically bad exploration draws. The problem is still huge, but it's not as bad as it used to be. And the fact that now when you have a 
a truce with someone or a diplomatic mission with them. You can move through their empty hexes before you couldn't. And that's pretty well all of the ones that are interesting. The rest, like you said, are all balancing changes and stuff like that. So what's missing from the first edition, the first edition had three core expansions and a bunch of mini expansions. Many of the mini expansions have been replicated in the Kickstarter box, things like the Pulsar and the Supernova and things like that. But there are a whole host of interesting, weird, and probably not balanced races from the expansions that have not been represented, which I kind of miss. I liked the time travelers. I liked the guys who mutated. I liked the guys with the cool orbitals. You know, these were nice. And the one of the expansions, namely the ship pack, is now part of the core base game. And point of fact, if you want the human ship designs, the, the, the miniatures that represent the human fleets, that was part of the Kickstarter, which may or may not see retail, who knows. Whereas the asymmetric alien unique designs, those are part of the core box. So which go think, figure. Which I think is better. No, I think it, that makes the, more sense. It, it, it is the better way to go. I agree. So the last real point I want to make is just the last turn of the game. And I think this... This always seems to be the problem in all of these like big 4X games when you, you know, you're coming down to the last turn and you can sort of look around and see who's winning. And then it always ends up most games of this ilk where you're doing weird stuff that you wouldn't normally do in a normal turn in order just to eke out those last few points. Mm. Well, the bigger problem that I have with the last round and the last couple of rounds is that Eclipse in both editions, leans hard into many of the traditional multiplayer conflict game problems. And that is, it's hard to identify the leader. You have to identify the leader because, you know, it's your job. It's it's what you have to do in order to pursue victory. But it's hard to identify the leader. Even if you identify the leader, sometimes you can't target the leader. QB, my previous complaints about exploration tiles. This is even assuming that you haven't accidentally hemmed yourself in and you realize in turn three that you've, you've... accidentally created a pa- an impossible pathway, but you still have two hours more of the game left to play. And all of this, again, can be exacerbated by random luck of the draw from the exploration tiles. Yeah, so I, I like the fact that you're incentivized to go combat because you get points just for fighting. That part is great, and I wish it had more of an uh, effect on decision-making, especially early in the game. But a lot of standard multi- multiplayer conflict game problems rear their ugly head, and that is particularly pronounced near the end of the game. I think the eight turns is fantastic length. I didn't think it went on too long. I think it scales really well with different player counts. You know, I agree. from two to six. It's yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be about three-ish hours, which uh, set up and tear down included, which I got to say, for a game of this sprawl, is very manageable. Part of that, I think, is a testament to the clever component decisions they've made in terms of management. Part of that is also just because of, as we've said, how smooth the play is, how smooth the actions are. Those are the element of Euro design that I absolutely appreciate in games of this ilk, when the actions give you maximum freedom rather than hemming you in and giving you all sorts of artificial constraints. And the fact that I think this is going to be very punishing to new players. If you've never played Eclipse before against players that have played it, it's just a lot of stuff to take in all at once with the techs and the combat and the ship design and the fact that, you know, you really need to explore it fast. And and, and knowing when you're ready to take that next risk. Again, this is a personal preference thing. I've commented this before. You have to kind of gut check when you're ready to go fight the Ancients, when you're ready to go fight a Guardian, when you're ready to go fight the GCDS, when you're ready to go invade your neighbor. And making these kinds kinds of intuitive leaps can be a little bit hard, especially if you're risk averse, which again helps to explain why a lot of time in Eclipse, you're going to be spending too much time turtling. Agreed. So for me, Eclipse is very much what I would call a guilty pleasure because the design shortcomings, as far as I'm concerned, are really, really glaring and really mar a lot of the gameplay experience. But the thing is, I'm going to keep coming back to Eclipse so long as it's got this beautiful element of ship design that brings me so much joy and is so much better than any other comparable thing in any other kind of 4X games. Like, there are lots of 4X light games that I really enjoy, my favorite of which probably is Warpgate, which has a lot of these elements in a 90-minute Euro game without any of these ridiculous exploration swings of fate. But Eclipse has these wonderful ship designs. Yeah, and it's not just so much like uh, making these ships so you can go up against the ancients or some sort of AI. It's it's watching other people design their ship and you're going, oh my God, how am I going to be able to counter that? And you look over at the tech thing. It's like, oh, if I, if I grab these two things and improve my computer, then his ship won't have a chance. I'll just, you know, you know, butter him in the first round. And, you know, I just, that part I love. And then watching that opponent either after an unsuccessful fight 
or after seeing your move, completely change the composition of their fleet such that now they're taking advantage of your ship design. Yeah, that part is absolutely peerless, and it is why I'm going to keep playing Eclipse. It's why I kept Eclipse in my collection. It's why I was enthusiastic about the second edition and all the rebalancing. And it's why I'm willing to put up with all the ridiculousness. We've spent a lot of time complaining about all the elements of, of Eclipse that we don't like. But at the end of the day, both of us, it seems, are willing to forgive it by virtue of the of, of the simple pleasures of building a perfectly calibrated cruiser that is able to bring death to your enemies. Agreed. That's going to do it for this week for So Very Wrong About Games. Thank you very much for joining us. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at The Games You Like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236, and you can find us on Patreon. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>